I'm S.A. Bradley, and welcome to Hellbent for Horror, a podcast devoted to all things related to horror, where I remind you that you used to love horror movies, and you secretly still do. So I want to start this episode with a quick quiz. Uh, These are going to be true or false questions. True or false? We only use 10% of our brains. True or false? Humans have five senses. True or false? Our tongues have different sections for different tastes. True or false? Napoleon was short. True or false? Glass is a liquid. True or false? Humans and dinosaurs coexisted. And true or false? Police wait 24 hours before they file a missing persons report. So, have you made your choices? Well, here are the answers. All of them are false. Napoleon was five foot seven. He was average height. Old glass looks like it flowed as a liquid because of imperfect glass blowing techniques in medieval times. You can go all the way back to Egypt. That doesn't happen. Uh, Even though 54% of Americans believe humans and dinosaurs coexisted, they miss each other by uh, about uh, 63 million years. Humans also have somewhere around 20 senses, not just five. And you can see many man-made structures from space easier than you can see the Great Wall of China. So let that one go. Dogs are not colorblind. Your blood in your body is never blue. And penguins don't mate for life. So did you find yourself disagreeing with what I said once or twice? Hey, you wouldn't be alone because these are the world's most common falsehoods that people are positive or true. You probably heard them from parents or from relatives or even teachers. Now, I mention all this because of what we're going to talk about today, and I wanted to show how very common beliefs may not be true. Uh, I think it's also to show that belief can be as secular as it is religious. And it's also how to show how easily popular culture can mix fact and fiction together and make a new truth. My guest on Hellbent for Heart today is John Arminio who is a member of our 50th episode roundtable. We're really happy to have John back. Now, John's returned to talk about how horror movies have played around with popular beliefs, and they've used them to tell stories about faith and perception, and how sometimes those movies and those ideas alter nonfiction through the fiction. John, welcome to the show. Uh, Thanks, Scott. It's a pleasure to be back and a privilege. Oh, thank you. The pleasure is all mine. So, John, I really uh, I thought about this episode and I thought about you because we've had some uh, interesting conversations uh, by way of email. Uh, And sometimes when we talked about uh, some religious areas, uh, you uh, brought up the fact that uh, you are not only a metalhead, uh, (laughs) death metal, uh, you can watch extreme horror films, but you're also uh, a very uh, devout Catholic. In other words, you are strong in your beliefs, Mm -hmm. uh, but you are not the kind of Catholic, if I may say, that I grew up with uh, when I was uh, a teenager uh, living in a coal mine town in Pennsylvania. Uh, This was an area where Vatican II didn't happen until about 1984, so they didn't actually acknowledge it. Uh, A lot of Latin masses, and there was a different feel to what I get from you and from others that I talk to, some uh, people who are famous, who uh, also let me know that they uh, are Catholic or they are religious in some way and spiritual, they have a much more open view of it. And so I wanted to talk about uh, this faith and perception because I watched a documentary that I asked you to watch uh, that I have to say is controversial to say the least. It's a documentary uh, by William Friedkin the director of The Exorcist, and it's called The Devil and Father Amorth. Uh, He returns to the world of exorcism, and really I found myself conflicted and of two minds about the movie. Uh, I think that there's something uh, very strange about the film, but I think that it also created a theme it didn't know it was going to create. First off, Friedkin's Exorcist. You know, it's kind of ground zero. It's a stepping point to how we look at the devil and possession these days from either side of that discussion. Friedkin has said that uh, audiences get out of the exorcist, whatever they bring to it. In other words, so if you uh, believe that the world is a horrible and hateful place, the exorcist is going to solidify that for you. If, on the other hand, you believe that there is a higher power that it will win over evil every time, you're going to feel that too. And I think that the exorcist Uh, certainly altered horror films, 
But I think uh, the question I want to ask is, do you think that it also altered reality? Uh, did the exorcist make skepticism easier as well as belief? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think it definitely changed the trajectory of horror um, kind of irreparably, you know, pr- probably for the next uncountable decades, because it changed how we perceive the supernatural, at least in horror, because, you know, the exorcist was made, you know, very soon after Vietnam during uh, Watergate. So this is prime mistrust of authority territory, especially like in the artistic fields and were asked by uh, Friedkin and Blatty uh, to put our trust in the most institutional authority figure in the universe, the Catholic church and kind of the, the remarkable thing about that movie is that it really does succeed in making us like want to believe that these Catholic priests are capable of saving this girl. And it really does that by making us mistrust like medical science, because we see how kind of cold and distant the doctors are when examining Reagan, you know, she gets a spinal tap. Um, she's putting the, through these horrible tests. That's only causing her more and more pain. And the only hope for relief is the supernatural solution one that I think audiences before then were not primed to believe because this is, you know, five years after not the living dead, which is one of the most anti authority uh, films of, of even, even the sixties, which is like, you know, like the ground zero of anti authoritism in, uh, in movies. Of course, this is highly impactful and, mm-hmm. I started thinking about uh, the uh, the legacy of The Exorcist in reality because of what I saw in The Devil and Father Amorth, which mm-hmm. for those that haven't seen it yet, this is William Friedkin going back to the devil and exorcism uh, for the first time since 1973 when he did The Exorcist. And this time he's seeing, quote unquote, a real exorcism. And he makes a big deal out of the idea that he has followed this chief exorcist for the Catholic Church right out of the Vatican. And he has gotten permission to go in and watch an actual exorcism with this guy 40 years or so after he has made the film. And so many times in this documentary, we're being told by Freak, and this is real, folks. This is legitimate, folks. And you've watched it. And I'm yeah. not sure. What, what are your thoughts? Do you feel that this was real scary even do you even think it was scary and why not i definitely think the people involved believed they were going through a real experience but i think the film was filmed and edited in such an amateurish manner that i can't take it for face value like there are clearly instances where in the editing friedkin just ADRs his questions onto live footage to make it right. seem like he was there or saying that from off camera. And it's, it, that's not what he's doing. He's presenting us with a, a false view of reality. Um, he consistently talks over his interview subjects um, trying to change the narrative. And so he has like neurologists from like Tel Aviv university, Columbia university. He has like the, the Archbishop of Los Angeles on right. and he, he won't let them say more than half a sentence. And so it makes me not believe anything in the documentary, or at least um, make me suspect about Friedkin's agenda, right. especially later uh, or in the middle of the movie, he says that he went to, to meet the subject, of the exorcism, this woman named Christina in a, in a church and he just happened to not bring his camera. And of course right. that's when everything started flying around in the air and the, everything became dark and cold and, and we're supposed to take him at his word. I, yeah. Sorry. I almost feel here's an Oscar winning director and a man who was nominated several times. Uh, this is a guy that people may not like for his point of view or his personality but they've usually said this is a a really strong director it almost feels like he's marty de bergy from uh, spinal tap you know he's like (laughs) the the alter ego of uh of rob reiner it almost feels like it's a put on and so you know it felt insincere and it felt exploitive 
But he brings up a couple really interesting things that uh, I'm not sure I tried to research. I mean, he says two leading news- newspapers in Italy say that uh, 500,000 Italians get exercised of possession every year out of 60 million Italians. So that's one out of every 120 people in Italy are actually involved with this directly. And uh, what I think is interesting is that there's all this stuff that you mentioned where, uh, you know, uh, this guy who's a a master filmmaker, he's not going to bring a camera. Seems very, very suspect to say the least. Yeah. You know, but we do get to see the exorcism itself. And what I think is really interesting and what happens in here uh, in this story or in this documentary is he may be trying to tell us, you know, I saw a real exorcism. This stuff is real. But I saw more of a social thing that was going on that made me think about how uh, movies can impact what we see or how we see things. Because uh, without giving away too much about this movie, we do watch an exorcism. Uh, it's a, basically a, an office room, I guess with Father Amorth, this 91-year-old guy who thumbs his nose at the devil when he starts. Uh, The entire family of this woman, Christina, who is on her ninth exorcism, is sitting there. Her loved ones are around. They start the chant. They start the prayer. He is amicable, Father Amorth. He's making little jokes. Uh, She seems to always be there. She's somewhat lucid through this whole thing until her uh, head starts to bob. But then At one point, he says something, and she lets out this Mercedes McCambridge growl. That sounds modulated. That sounds like it came from the film. And I should be horrified, right? I should be really scared, but I'm not. The people in that room aren't scared. And I'm sitting there going, the devil sounds like Mercedes McCambridge from the film. That's interesting. Is it that they got it right in the film, or is it that... The manifestations are coming from what has now become part of popular culture. Over the last 45 years, in any movie, in anything that's going on with the devil, the voice is guttural and is going to go like that. And she, uh, it hit me all of a sudden that the impact of The Exorcist isn't just on the storytelling of the movie or how horror films went, but that it actually has gotten itself in the fabric of what it originally was documenting when it was first made. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I I definitely agree, especially because if one out of every 120 people in Italy are experiencing an exorcism and each exorcism has a room full of people in it, a lot of people have been witnesses to exorcisms. So everybody in Italy knows what to expect. So they know how the person being exorcised needs to sound for the rest of the room to believe them. So it's this kind of self-perpetuating cycle of of a belief system that can really be damaging to the people that it's trying to help. Like if if you have to be exercised nine times and you still feel right. yourself possessed by the devil, that's got to be traumatizing to everyone, you know, especially the person who's possessed, but also the, their family. Like they're, it's, it's traumatic every time. I think what's really interesting is that they don't seem to be horrified at all. I don't yes, know if the, by the ninth time the devil's lost his luster or what. But I think that what's interesting about this is that the mindset of both the clergy and the medical profession seem to have gone topsy-turvy. Uh, it, instead of it being a very gothic thing, they're basically talking about like it's a disease. Yes. In fact, they call it a spiritual disease. And uh, when she's asked if she went to a doctor or a psychiatrist, uh, she goes, no, this is a spiritual disease. If I had a physical pain, I'd go to a doctor. If I had a, an emotional, mental pain, I would go to see a psychiatrist. They're not going to be able to do anything with this. I go to the psychiatrist because this is a spiritual disease. So they're really almost like using medical terms or putting it as a medical emergency as opposed to what we had in the first movie and what I grew up with, which which was like, this is really terrifying. It's almost like the the devil's an annoyance, like it's Lyme disease or something. Yeah, almost like like if you're possessed by a really weak devil, you go to like the the Catholic pharmacy and get some like like over-the-counter strength holy water or something. You could just dash it with yourself and you're cured. But I I think what some of the movies that we're going to be talking about later – 
kind of pick up on is that sometimes these medical ailments can be inroads into something legitimately terrifying that involves the the spiritual realm or um because i think if if we're talking about somebody's soul and you're suffering from a disease like dementia or alzheimer's um it seems like your soul is gone it seems like you're a different person and so i think in that way there is kind of a confluence of medical science and spirituality at least for people who believe themselves to be possessed or people who are suffering from the dementia. Right. But in America, we get the, the, the difference, which is uh, in the medical community, uh, Friedkin gets neurologists and he gets psychiatrists together. And at one point he basically goes, so what do you think this is? Unconscious fraud? And they're like, no, 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 no. In fact, they never say that this is a psychosis. Uh, they never say that this is fake. They say, we don't understand this, which is a completely different way of looking at it than they did 45 years ago. And I can't help but feel like this has been put on the table over 45 years, over the constant barrage of exorcist-style movies and just the, the way that, that things are going to look a certain way and feel a certain way because of how it was put in that movie. They mention how people are very context-dependent. So... Uh, the doctors are looking at this as a behavioral phenomenon, but they also don't say, they don't illegitimize the idea of mental pain being any different than physical pain. At one point, a neuro neurologist says that uh, the physical pain has a mental piece to it. And there's something called, oh my God, intervenes with the singulum, whatever that is, which I don't know. He says they still have the pain, but now they can tolerate it. Uh, and they don't discount the emotional pain as being equal. And so uh, when they're being confronted, these guys are like, there are areas where our expertise ends. And after that expertise, there's another line uh, of the unknowable. After that, I'm willing to put an entity, if you want to call it God, then we'll say, then it's God. So there's no separation anymore. It's like somehow these groups that used to just attack each other all the time, they're actually seeing medicinal value in exorcism in a way that they cannot help people because culturally everybody in that room believes it's the devil therefore uh, that's probably going to be the best medicine for this person and uh, I think yeah we're going to talk about a, a few more films uh, and I, I, what I think we, we've done in picking these is we we're looking at uh, this phenomenon of how culture can be moved by uh, what we see and hear in movies or what we've been told over years, like what does Santa Claus look like? Well, that all comes basically from a Coca-Cola ad, right? But that's Santa, right? But we know it's Santa now. Uh, so let's talk about how that's happened with some movies that we've got here. And I think the first one I want to talk about is one where we talk about that psychosis uh, of images that, curses somebody and uh, that would be the witch by david eggers and what i think is really interesting about the witch first off it takes place in 1630s puritan new england uh first before i go down that path do you want to talk a little bit you want to give a little bit of an overview of what the witch is all about sure um the witch is honestly one of my favorite uh probably at this point one of my favorite horror movies of all time um, but it centers around this family in late 17th century new england who take it upon themselves to break apart from their Puritan uh, settlement and set up on their own in the middle of this Massachusetts uh, wilderness. And slowly but surely, the family disintegrates um, through a combination of paranoia, uh, unpreparedness, and supernatural influences. And um, it really gets to the heart of why those kind of puritanical societies uh, are so self-destructive, um, especially in the terms of uh, the, the eldest daughter, Thomason, who has an independent spirit behind her and a, and a mind, a very powerful mind, and someone who wants to think for herself. And so she is coming up against this society that uh, will not allow that. And so, of course, the solution that society um, – has to quash that is witchcraft, uh, which 
Puritan to believe was as real as I believe the microphone in front of me is real. Right. Uh, and you, you hit on a couple of things that I think make this one of my favorite horror films, because I, I, I can certainly relate, relate to it. Uh, the reason this movie interests me so much is because it shows how fervor of any type, but for this movie, we're talking religious beliefs, religious fervor can become pathological. Now, what I think is really interesting about him being a Puritan, this family being a Puritan, a Puritanical family, is they're kind of ostracized. They're pushed out of the Puritan community because uh, he's kind of a radical. He wants to be even more literal about what the Bible says. So we have where symbols can become real in the minds of some. So even though the... Uh, the Puritans themselves are somewhat literalist about the Bible. They've learned somehow to live in a secular fashion, which drives the, the, the father of this family, William, insane. He thinks that they're all heretical. And they think he's heretical for considering them heretical. So it's a, a very patriarchal place. Uh, but fiction itself can become nonfiction when you don't have anybody to bounce any ideas off. So this family leaves the Puritan village to go out in the wilderness and homestead basically on their own, believing that God is going to take care of them. But they're taking every superstition and every prejudice and every visual image that they've learned out into the woods. And there's no one to tell them you're, you're imagining things, you know, this is uh, not happening. The woods are exactly kind of like how Freakin says that the exorcist, you, you take uh, whatever you bring to it is what you'll get out of it. When they go out to the wilderness, everything that they fear becomes real. Now, the thing is, is the movie, uh, is everything coming true or is it just psychological? And the movie keeps that balance that we're not necessarily sure. Uh, we have a lot of things that happen that can be seen as supernatural or can be seen as psychosis. And one of the things that's really interesting is that you can have supernatural interpretations, but I've also had people come to me and tell me that this is a psychological film where everything that we think we see that is supernatural is a manifestation of how the scared family is defining things. They're seeing, we're seeing things through their eyes. There is no real witch. You know, people see this when they're alone. You know, there's no one else that can talk to them. The tragedy of the child may be enough to drive them over the edge. The starvation that they're feeling may be enough to put them over the edge. The isolation may be enough. When they're scared enough, they're hungry enough, they're sick enough, they're grieving enough. All of the things that they heard, old wives tales and stuff, seem as if they could be true. So I think that that uh, is one of the reasons that I think it is really exciting. And uh, you probably noticed many of the, the visual images that are in there. Um, the apple is one yeah. of the things that really hits me. Uh, one of the things that uh, I didn't bring up in that true or false thing was that there's nowhere in the Bible that it's mentioned as an apple. You know, in the garden. Being, who knows what it was, but it's never mentioned to be an apple. But Forever, it is an apple. Uh, chances are it was pomegranate or a fig, depending upon where in the fertile crescent this thing was taking place. But they see apples. There's no factual reason that uh, uh, the apple would be holy. So either the supernatural takes on the totem that the believer has given power, or they got it right on the first try. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, and I, I think um, there's a couple really telling images in the in the movie. Like, there's a couple just shots of a hare, right? Um, H a r e, and in folklore um, during like uh, this time period, hares were what witches would t would turn into if they wanted to kind of sneak into a civilization and cause harm to people. So. There are a couple shots of a hare in the witch, and then a misfortune happens to the family soon thereafter. But if you believe that, then you're so your life is so consumed by fear that you can't go into the woods and see a rabbit without becoming frightened of the world around you. That's a profoundly like terrifying way to, to live your life. Um, and and you know, even when you know, the um, 
you know, we're talking about how kind of filtering this movie through a possible psychological interpretation, you know, one of the obvious uh, hints that it is supernatural is when the son just encounters this woman in the middle of the woods that, and she comes out and kind of caresses his face and it turns out to be an old crone. But if you're like a 13 year old boy living with nobody, but your family living on, in this oppressive society, you might hallucinate a beautiful woman coming <laughs> to kiss you into the middle of the woods. Cause because you have no outlet for any of these urges that are roiling within you, which by the way are sinful and will cause you to go to hell. Right. So uh, yeah, that reality that they're living under is pretty nightmarish without witchcraft even getting involved. Yeah, a, a, a movie is imbued with sin. It's an entire life that is based on the idea that I'm not really worthy to be on this planet. I'm doing everything that I can to redeem the sins that I've done. And even the sin of pride of me trying to say that I'm the sin of humility. <laughs> I have no humility because yeah. I'm saying I'm working on my humility. Yeah, you know, it's that kind of weird circle that they're going through. And, and especially because they're Calvinist, which means that you're like predestined for salvation. But mm -hmm. then the infant is killed before it's baptized, so it's not saved. So it's this weird cycle of, like, trusting in God's destination or destiny for you, but then being damned anyway. So it's this kind of recursive nightmare of of your damned if you do damned if you don't. And right. oof, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I'm not alive uh, at, at that point in history. Well, that's uh, one of the things that I wanted to talk about. We have uh, both come from uh, religious backgrounds, and mine was a fundamentalist background. And I happened to be one of the, the lucky uh, Cracker Jack box winners of being part of a, a cult, basically, that said that the world was going to end in 1975. So I lived with the idea of how William is in this movie, my dad, my mom and dad were kind of like this. There was a literalism to everything that was in the Bible and everything that they saw, you know, the price of meat goes up. That's prophesied in, in first Samuel. I mean, that's freaking obvious. So the world's coming to an end, right? Uh, the black Panthers, uh, the riots, uh, assassinations of presidents. Uh, we have, uh, impeachments, uh, all of this stuff is happening, and it feels like to my dad, who grew up in the 50s with sock hops, that the world is coming to an end. So these biblical prophecies and this numerology that he was involved with and my mom was involved with, they saw demons everywhere. They saw sin everywhere. And this is modern day. So I really felt that this was a believable film because I saw how untreated, you know, there were people that were in that religion of my parents that weren't as literalist about it. They were like, yeah, I own a construction company. They say I can't smoke in this religion, but you know what? I like smoking, so I'm going to keep smoking. But my dad was like, you know, no, well, you know, we have to go by this completely. So the idea of how my family at times, and I will say that there was a little bit of mental uh, health issues as well, uh, terrified by a, a set of praying hands that they found in a, uh, a, a dresser drawer that they bought at a, some thrift store, that they were frightened by an image, an, a, a graven image as they thought it was. You know, the idea of praying hands was idolatry in the eyes of how they define things in, in the book. I really felt this movie as, you know, you can work yourself up into believing that you suddenly can't remember the Lord's Prayer and that this means that the devil has gotten into you too. And uh, that kind of hysteria is really interesting. And one of the things that you probably noticed in the movie, that his crops aren't working, right? Uh, yeah. So this father goes out and he, he uh, is going to be on the land. He's terrible. He can't hunt. And he can't uh, farm. He's shit for a guy who's supposed to go out and save his family. But there's a mold that's on the corn. And that, co uh, that, uh, that mold was actually something that happened around the Salem witch trials and the decade before the Salem witch trials where there was started to be this kind of hysteria. It was ergot. It's a hallucinogenic fungus. 
that many attribute to the real life stories of possession witchcraft that happened at that time. And David Edgar's the writer knew that and put that in there. So you have the additional idea that everybody might be hallucinating because of mold and they're believing that the the, the ram is talking or the, the sheep is talking and all of that stuff. I think it's a really interesting way to look at this film. And uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, how do you break on this? Do you feel it's more of a supernatural thing uh, in this film since it's one of your favorites? What is it that really connects you to it? Um, I think I think it does pivot supernaturally um, in the end. Um, but what I think makes it so puts it over the top in terms of its power is that it's it, it's such this kind of incredible statement of, of really feminism um, in, in horror and in film um, because for Thomason, it's a happy ending. Right. And that idea is the fact that the, that she can be better off in a coven of witches who are willing to <laughs> grind up the organs of a, an infant to make their potus to allow them to fly for that to be a better option for her than her loving family is points to a really diseased society. And so any society that oppresses an entire gender in that way is really doomed uh, to failure. And so for a film to put that so eloquently and so in such a terrifying and visually arresting way, I think is going to be in my, you know, all time list of movies. So I, you know, I mentioned a little bit about my uh, interesting background. Are you, comfortable in talking a little bit about how you uh, deal with your faith, especially when, say, you're watching. We talked or I mentioned earlier that you're a heavy metal fan and all of this. And when I was growing up, that was kind of contradictory. You know, uh, my friends who were into heavy metal, uh, they got yelled at by their parents a lot because it was like, are you really involved in devil stuff and everything? But it sounds like in conversations that I've had with you that you have a very open and healthy, if I may say, way of looking at your spirituality and questioning it. Yeah, I'm perfectly willing to talk about that. I, I find that topic uh, really fascinating. Um, you know, I, I think if if my faith is so weak that it can't stand up to King Diamond singing about ghosts <laughs> with an upside down cross pin on his face, then, then what, what, what am I doing? Like, I, I don't even deserve to call myself <laughs> faithful at all um i think that that kind of i think it's interesting i think it's a way to, to kind of challenge myself and my own ideas to kind of dive into stuff like death metal and, and black metal um I, I like the music uh i've i think dark stories and dark imagery have always appealed to me uh whether it's in horror or in, in music, I mean, I was a little kid trying to read Edgar Allan Poe stories. Um, when I was like six years old, my favorite wrestler was The Undertaker. Like, obviously, <laughs> you know, like uh, all this kind of stuff is just in my blood. And and I've just been able to kind of integrate it in, into my psychology because I think it kind of maybe inoculates me uh, the way that horror can, horror fiction can inoculate us against kind of the horror in real life and help us kind of deal with it psychologically. I think being challenged by heavy metal um, in terms of when it's, you know, presented as a way to challenge me, th then I can kind of integrate my faith into modern society, which, you know, like there's no evidence. You know, I believe in, I believe in science and I believe in, in an evidence-based uh, society. So how can I incorporate those ideas into my life, um, how can I believe that medical science is extraordinarily important? Um, I think heavy metals actually help me um, incorporate ideas that don't necessarily comport with my religiosity. So I, I bring all of that up because uh, I want to move into our next film. And it's a film that has been called blasphemous many times, highly controversial. It's, it's impossible, actually, to get the director's cut of it. Uh, it's been cut up so many times. Uh, the edited versions are still around. But I actually think that it's a very spiritual film. It's also a very interesting knock on politics. But I think at the center of the film is someone 
who kind of falls into what you're talking about in how you reconcile with things. He's an honest guy who also has his flaws and he's abused by a system that is really all about politics and putting that into a sanctity. So the movie is Ken Russell's The Devils. It's directed by Ken Russell, who was a devout Catholic. And when he talks about the, the movie The Devils, he speaks about how uh, this movie helped challenge him around some of his beliefs and made uh, talked about some of his worries about his beliefs. But at no time does he talk about a true doubt. He may talk about challenging, uh, and he is he makes a distinction by how he makes the central character in this, Father Grandier, who is an actual true character in life, uh, how he shows him versus the forces that are around him. So it's not only uh, that I think that this is a very spiritual film, but I think that it also hits on the idea of that hysteria or symbols, how symbols unchecked can cause uh well, lack of thinking, uh, but it can make things that aren't true seem true. So, uh, what? Did you, first off, have you seen The Devils before? I, I asked you to watch it here. Yeah, um, I had seen it years ago. My cousin had actually obtained a VHS bootleg of it, and so we, we watched <laughs> it uh, at, at home or at at his house. Uh, so that was an experience. Um, and then, and then I watched it again uh, in prepar- preparation for this podcast. Yeah. So uh, it's a true story embellished quite a bit, and it's not the first time it's been embellished. Uh, the, it's Aldous Huxley uh, wrote about this first. Then there was a play uh, that was very famous, uh, and then comes the movie The Devil. So it's a, about uh, the devils of Ludon, which happened in uh, 1634. You had a priest uh, who, in the end of it all, he's burned at the stake. Uh, but the movie centers around this Roman Catholic priest, Uh, Grandier and an entire convent of uh, Ursuline nuns who allegedly became possessed by demons after Grandier made a pact with Satan. And this led to several uh, public exorcisms as well as this execution by burning. Uh, It's a true life story. There is uh, speculation once again that there was a hallucination was caused by wheat that had mold on it. And the, uh, the effect was kind of like an LSD experience. But I think what this is all about is power. And I think what uh, Ken Russell does here is he makes a separation between church and state and what can happen when the dangers of the state getting too close with the church and what can happen there. So the difference between belief and a system that may be corruptible, I think, is the battle that's happening inside of this movie. What are your thoughts on what you got out of the devils? Well, I think, uh, yeah, this definitely is about systems of power and you know, it it does kind of uh, present itself as a screed against pol- a screed against uh, corrupt politics and using people uh, for a politician's own means. But it, it's also another sign of how, as we saw in the witch, how witchcraft is used to kind of um, suppress women, even women who are supposed to be kind of captains of their own spiritual ship, like nuns. Because right. like all it takes for these nuns to become insane with jealousy and possessed by the devil is that they want to have sex with Father Grandier. Like they're so weak right. spiritually and physically that this causes them to go insane and be possessed by the devil. And so, of course, that gives the exorcist the excuse to uh, do all sorts of horrific tortures onto the nuns who are possessed and that they're supposed to be ostensibly helping. And so, yeah, this is what filmmakers were portraying exorcism as before The Exorcist. So it's uh, rather different. Yeah. Uh, and I think uh, in a way it's kind of talking about the the, the fragility of uh, the individual in a mob rule situation. Yes. What I think is really interesting here is that Russell uh, – so the, the idea of the movie is Cardinal Richelieu is in charge uh, of France. And all of these small towns have stone walls around them and they have their own authority. But little by little, the church has been coming in along with the state and taking over these lands. Most of this is about land grabs. They want to go to Ludo 
But Richelieu says, you know, I've been uh, give. I gave my word to this uh, the guardian of this uh, this city, uh, who was also a religious man, that we would never touch a stone that's on his wall. So you can grab any of the places that you want, but you can't have Ludon. But Ludon is kind of one of these places that is pivotal to taking every other spot around it, and there's a permissiveness and a brashness to the guy who's in charge now, Father Glandier, that really rubs uh, the uh, religious and the, uh, the government builders uh, the wrong way. So even though he is a womanizer, uh, you know, he has sins of the flesh and he is a proud man, they're not going to be able to take him down on that. What they find is a spot of weakness. It's very political in that way. They find out that Grandier not only has impregnated a girl, uh, has had a marriage, quote unquote marriage, outside of uh, the church, but they also find out that there is a mother superior with this Ursuline monk, uh, nuns, that uh, has mental issues and she is obsessed with this guy. And they take something that they know is fake. They know that this isn't true. And that's what I think is really interesting about this movie. The exorcist doesn't believe this stuff. Richelieu doesn't believe this stuff. The only people who believe it are the, the followers. You know, the, the guys in charge are using every game in town to say, this guy has made a pact with Satan and he has possessed uh, these nuns. Oh, by the way, nuns, anything that you do isn't your fault because you're possessed. And that's when the repression just explodes and they do everything that they can. And there are many moments of mockery that happens at the higher levels of the church and higher levels of uh, the government saying, what are you doing in Ludo uh, to, the, to the exorcist? It's like, what are you doing there? And it's like, oh, no, we have a major problem here. They don't believe it at all. They're, they're kind of going along with this. And the, the reason it's so important is because people – uh, aren't going to kill this guy uh, or let him get run out of town by being an average sinner. You know, being so at one point, Grandier says, Call me vain and proud. Call me the greatest sinner to ever to walk God's earth. But Satan's boy, I could never be. I haven't the humility. That's such a great moment. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I think makes this movie work so well is how powerful Oliver Reed's performance is. Like, he's so incredibly charismatic and. In, but also incredibly vulnerable that we can believe that he has the flaws that he, his character shows, but also has the charisma to lead this whole town. It's, it's a really a bravura performance. Yeah, it's fantastic. And I think it's really interesting because the reality is he's telling the truth all the time. You know, he is being God's servant. He may be vain and proud, but he is willing to be redeemed on that, willing to be punished on that. The people who are not being uh, honest are the people who are trying to push an agenda that they know will get him taken out. You know, and especially at a time when I think uh, this about 25% of the people in France were dying of the Black Death. So the, the, the plague is taking people down. The feeling of evil in the world is right there. Death is almost a joke at this point. So when they decide to burn uh, Father Grandier, they're going to burn him at the stake. It's a party. Uh, what what other thoughts do you have about the devils, if any? Well, um, there are some really remarkable details that the movie includes that are true, like the the fact that Father Grandier was kind of shaved um, but before he was executed. Uh, the the torture of the the boards being kind of like hammered into his legs to, to break his legs several mm -hmm. times on um, the fact that he never can actually confess, which is very uncommon at the time. So th those are all real details, but I also think that it, without going into the details of it, this movie does uh, uh, portray the conflict of the post religious wars, France kind of atmosphere extraordinarily well, because this is, not far removed from Martin Luther in Germany, but that mm -hmm. kind of cascaded into uh, Catholics versus Huguenots in France. And so this is post that whole conflict. And so people are just on tender hooks, not wanting to see their own town 
um, be destroyed by the influence of outsiders. So in this case would be Cardinal Richelieu and, and the King. So with, even without providing you a history lesson, Ken Russell really portrays the paranoia of that time uh, really well. And that results in uh, some pretty dis- uh, disastrous outcomes. And, you know, 500 years later, we're still seeing politicians use the paranoia of, of war to their own advantage, even when they know what they're saying is completely false. So this is a movie that we have psychosis taking over and people mistake obsession and repression for possession. Let's talk about a movie that does the opposite. And this is The Taking of Deborah Logan. And uh, this movie really hit me uh, as something that I felt was very clever. It reminded me of, once again, the early movie, The Exorcist, where uh, in mid-exorcism, Father Karras and and Father Marin are sitting exhausted on the stairs. And Karras asks the older gentleman, uh, you know, why is this happening? And he says, the devil wants to make us despair, wants us to believe that we are not worthy of love. And this movie, taking of Deborah Logan, uses disease as a, a form of despair, a, a way of making us less than, and that that has correlations with possession or is actually the wolf in sheep's clothing uh, that uh, we think that it's a medical issue and it may actually be this spiritual illness that happens. Uh, so in, in taking a Deborah Logan, we have the idea that we may be looking at a disease, but it may not be a disease after all. You want to give a little bit of an idea of what you thought uh, of Deborah Logan or give the plot? Yeah, well, the taking of Deborah Logan is um, it's centered around a film student attempting to make a documentary film about the uh, – kind of mental descent of someone with it, the advanced stages of Alzheimer's. And so they, she gets a crew together. They go to this woman who's agreed to be part of the study, uh, Deborah Logan, who is living with her daughter. And s- very quickly, it is made clear that this is not a normal case of Alzheimer's. And no matter what they do to try and explain what is going on with her, because she exhibits kind of feats of strength that are very unusual for an elderly woman, um, self-mutilation, uh, unusual sounds in, in the house, um, and unexplainable behaviors, like digging in the yard, this kind of thing, violent outbursts. And no matter what they do, um, they cannot help this woman who is otherwise helpless, especially when she's not exhibiting signs of possession. And eventually it leads to kind of this dark secret that the family has been keeping for years, um, which is really uh, subtly uh, revealed to, to the viewer. And I I think a really masterful way, this is a movie that does so much with so little. And Mm -hmm. I I really admire what they did here. Um, Especially once you reach a certain age, um, all of us have dealt with, uh, the descent and the death of an elderly relative. Right. And so seeing the way that her physical decay is so painful and so visceral to the people there, it's really heart wrenching. Like when she, when there's a, a couple of scenes where Deborah Logan just decides to like rip her own skin off and right. it's just, it's not really that gory, but it, affected me more than most gore scenes in movies <laughs> like that, that those those like you know few score inches of skin are worth 80 gallons of blood in, in most other horror movies oh yeah uh, i think um the the frailty and yes. the innocence uh, is one of the things that really works like you mentioned uh for the devils oliver reed's performance hinges everything keeps everything going i think jill larson yeah. as deborah logan is un- unbelievable uh, if any, if you've ever had anybody in your family that suffered from dementia, it is this very strange thing where they're hiding it until they can't hide it anymore. So they're living with, if we're taking this as an analogy for possession, which is what this movie tries to do, or a, a clever cover for possession, she's living with this entity 
in pain, in suffering for a long time, but doesn't want anybody to know because she can't believe that it's happening to herself. And you have uh, the, the horrors that they talk about what Alzheimer's is. Uh, so that in case you don't know, you know, you're talking about how it attacks, it just wipes out the neurons. Uh, first, it takes out the, some of the memory. Then it takes out the neurons for logic and people start having hallucinations. But it takes away the oldest and most precious memories, the oldest and most precious memories. How do you fight something that you can't see? So it is like possession. You have something that is no longer allowing you to be you, but you're in there. And you will see that sometimes with people who have dementia, they'll come in and out. And in this movie talks about that quite a bit, where she'll be standing there and uh, she'll forget what she's doing there. And she starts talking to the people who are doing this uh, interview with her. And she's going, you know, everything's going well. I have mental things that I do to keep myself going. But when it goes away, when my mind just goes away, it's just so frustrating and so upsetting. And so that's like possession. When you hear about these uh, movies or even in the Bible where you have people who are trapped uh, I thought that that was really interesting, but it doesn't just stay with Alzheimer's. You have three different diseases that are talked about as almost like you're susceptible when you're weak. You know, with, once again, spiritual illness, mental illness, uh, or physical illness. You have Lou Gehrig's disease, you have Alzheimer's, and you have cancer that figure prominently in this movie. And the people who get possessed all have those. Um, I, it's... It's a way to make possession seem so logical, almost mm -hmm. like if if you're mentally or physically weak, well, of course, those are the people that a uh, wayward demon will be looking uh, to to possess. Uh, and and I think in in this film, um, the the demon who you know, spoiler alert, uh, turns out to be uh, <laughs> the, the the ghost of a uh, a murderer um, who himself was spiritually weak so he needs to feed on the weak that are around him to survive whether he he's alive or dead uh and and i think that's also why uh stories of possession usually involve children because children are uh you know we we feel they need to be protective of them because they are not as strong as adults and they need our protection uh from all sorts of threats be it spiritual or physical and the tragic one of the tragedies of alzheimer's is that those patients revert to a state of childish vulnerability and dangerous uh yes. they're, they're, they become aggressive and dangerous and uh, that's one of the things that i love about this movie is that it doesn't have to do a lot yeah 90 percent of the things that happen in that film are things that people with dementia or advanced alzheimer's do and they get so much suspense and actual fear. There are some great jumps in that movie. Uh, you don't even have to know that there's a, a demon involved. You don't have to know if there's a possession. She's frightening in and of itself of just watching somebody going down that path. But then it goes, that extra 10%, that 10% that certainly is not yeah. uh, anything that's physiological. And so I, I really think that that was very cool. Yeah, there are. There's a couple scenes where Deborah Logan is just standing in the hallway holding the hand of a little girl, and mm -hmm. that in itself, without context, should not be a terrifying image. But because of the the previous, you know, ten, twenty, thirty minutes that we've seen, is horrifying, uh, especially like the look on their faces. And I, it's able to get us to project all our fears of our own spiritual weakness and of our own bodies onto this movie. Because you know, w what if our loved ones or our or ourselves became so downtrodden physically and spiritually that this could be happening to us or, or a loved one. So uh, we we started by talking about the devil and Father Amorth, and uh, <laughs> we can say whatever we want about that. But what it did is it kind of made me think of a movie that I know that you really love as well. And I'm glad that you brought it up as a suggestion for this particular topic. And that is William Peter Blatty's The Exorcist Three, because there's something very, you know, uh, like in Father Amorth, he has an exorcism, right? 
he's 91. He turns 91 on the day of the exorcism. And they're all sitting there right after he's just possessed, uh, you know, done an exorcism on this woman who's possessed. They're all singing happy birthday to you. And it's surreal. Yes. It's frigging surreal. And I'm like, well, why is this in the movie? What is this? And you get this feeling that there's a showmanship going on. A lot of the symbolism that happens is showmanship. What makes us believe sometimes in good is how bad things can be. We start reaching out towards that. And so the best showman has often been called the devil. You know, you hear that all the time uh, in Paradise Lost. The, the most exciting character uh, is the devil. And so I think that Blatty was on to something really, really interesting about how there's a showbiz mentality about how we define the predilections of evil. I think he really hit on something here. How evil is packaged and sold is done with a certain level of showbiz tro tropes, but he takes this in a really, really disturbing and devastating fashion. And in a way, makes a strangely uplifting film at the end. Um, yeah, I... I totally agree. Like th this is a movie that really kind of took me by surprise when I first saw it because of, you know, the, how far drop in quality exorcist two was from the first one. <laughs> oh, uh, boy. But like, this is a movie that again, anchored by great performances, uh, like Brad Dourif as a, mm. a possessed, uh, serial killer, um, is absolutely amazing. And that's kind of a, a really tired cliche at this point in filmmaking, but e even watching it now, he's incredibly creepy and terrifying. Uh, George C. Scott as the kind of weathered downtrodden uh, Lieutenant Kinderman is absolutely so empathetic and believable. Um, oh somebody, my God. Yeah. He's so much like, he makes me want to cry like how much he really cares about, about this. And so his contrast with Brad Dourif's character is kind of a um, you know a classic uh, dichotomy of almost of from classical theater about how different these two characters can be, and so much of their interaction is presented in a cell, which kind of functions like a, a black box, and mm -hmm. you know how much of kind of quotes and Shakespearean references that Brad Dourif's character kind of brings into their conversation, like everything is playing on two levels: what, what's actually happening, what's not happening. And I that think sense of theater. Yes, exactly. exactly. And the movie is playing on your expectations so expertly because early on in the movie. Yeah. For those who haven't seen it yet, uh, why don't you give a little bit of a synopsis of the plot? Um, so uh, Lieutenant Kinderman, who uh, we saw in the first Exorcist, has been investigating a series of very grisly, um, horrifically cruel murders. And they start to remind the him of the serial killer named Gemini, who is supposedly uh, dead. But the his co-workers in the police department kind of don't care. Um, there is definitely a bit of institutionalized racism because a lot of the victims are people of color. And so the police care even less, and he points it out to them. And so through his friendship with a priest who is also um, kind of dis descending physically, he uh, comes across um, Brad Dourif's character, you know, in trying to find a way to stop these, these serial murders and the, the horror that uh, ascends from there. Yeah. The, the, the idea is it's a 15 years from the exorcism of Reagan McNeil. And we have, um, Father Karras has died. Oddly enough, we find out later in the film that at the same time, this Gemini killer who was imprisoned for all these horrible uh, murders that he did was also executed at, around that time. So the characters, Kinderman and uh, the, the priest who I'm now I'm dropping the name, I can't remember. Father Dyer? Father Dyer, that's it, uh, become fast friends over that 15 years, and they're mourning the death of Karis. They get together on his birthday all the time. Uh, what we find is that something stayed alive on that was supposed to die <laughs> during that uh, Reagan's exorcism in the first film. And it's a vengeful demon. Yes. You know, Pazuzu is never named in this film, but he is named as the other party or the cruel one. And it has taken vengeance. 
that it had was not able to stay in uh, in the body of that girl. And everything that's happening has been put into place by this demon who decides that showbiz is the best thing. And the showbiz is uh, just evil in itself. Isn't that frightening? It's the extent of evil, the depth of evil that goes. And for me in this movie, uh, showbiz to demons is sadism. The more sadistic and horrible and affecting, and I can't believe there can be a God kind of violence that happens, which is done in this movie, uh, is the, the most fascinating thing to me about it. Yeah, I agree. And and even the, the Shakespearean references that the Gemini Killer makes are like to Titus Andronicus, which right. is notoriously <laughs> Shakespeare's most violent. Um, and he, he really glorifies in every little violent detail that uh, the Gemini Killer has committed or will commit, and or he forces Kinderman to relive those violent images. He, he forces him to describe those violent images. The Gemini Killer or, or the cruel one talks about how the whole reason he's possessing the physical husk that it is or was Father Karras is to force the spirit of Father Karras to continually watch every cool act that he does. And so that's so tragic because of the sacrifice Father Karras made in the first Exorcist movie, you know, to basically kill himself. He's now trapped in this, like, hell uh, watching the cruel one commit all these murders. I think it's, it's so shocking when father Karras even shows up because I think yeah, we, we see the flashbacks to father Karras falling down the steps, the, the, you know, the famous Georgetown steps uh, from the first movie, but we never see his face. Um, so those of us familiar with filmmaking language are thinking, or at least me like, Oh, he's not, that, that the actor is not, with us for this movie because it's a sequel and that's just how Hollywood works. So then when we actually see his face, like in, in the, like at the end of the second act, it's so shocking that it's a testament to Blatty's uh, directorial choices and, and his writing that he's able to kind of pull the wool over even veteran horror watchers eyes. Uh -huh. Uh, and really kind of devastate us because of the, the affection that I had for the first movie um, definitely plays into The Exorcist 3, but I think the strength of the writing and, and the performances um, make it stand on its own because it, it's a very, very different film. Oh, yeah. It's a great response to uh, the, the first exorcist. You know, what happens? You have this exorcism of this girl, but the world goes on. Yes. And this is, I think it was a, kind of a stroke of brilliance that in a way, Blatty proves that there is an afterlife and there is uh, supernatural forces through evil as opposed to a burning bush. He makes it so that it's impossible for uh, the detectives to think it's anything except something that couldn't be possible. Uh, at one point, uh, the, uh, the uh, Gemini killer drains every drop of blood from these are spoiler alerts. I do apologize to anybody who didn't see the film. It's well worth seeing. Believe me, a victim uh, ends up having all of their blood removed from their body. They're exanguated. exanguated. I can never say it. They lose all of their blood. Uh, and it's, it's all pulled out of the person into small specimen jars like you would piss into. And they have a bunch of these specimen jars all neatly lined up as if somebody had rulers and uh, squares to make sure that everything was architecturally straight. There's not a drop of blood on the ground. There's not a drop of blood or a smudge on any of those, uh, uh, those jars. And the person is dead and their head is gone. They've been decapitated. We find out that the body also had this drug in it that is used for electroshock therapy, that if you're off by a milligram, you kill the person. But if you have it where you do 10 milligrams per 50 pounds, you can cause an exquisite death, which is they slowly suffocate. They can't speak. They can't move, but they can feel everything. And that is all happening within one person who's killed. Impossible, especially when it seems that the main person who may have done this is a woman 
with dementia who's about 85 years old. How does this happen? The why is why we go to spiritual things anyway. Why is this happening? So in a way, Vladdy gives us a monster that is so horrible that we start to ask that why. And even Kinderman says uh, in the end, he... Uh, uh, the demon keeps saying, you know, you are a man of no faith. I'm going to test your faith. I'm going to make you believe. And he makes him believe in him. He believes in the filth and the horror of the world and the evil of things. And in the end, he also believes that there's something better because of how this movie goes. It's very interesting, very inspirational, very crazy. Yeah, I think... From Blatty's perspective, I think that is that's the kind of self defeating nature of the devil and evil because the the worst the devil can do, the most cruel things that the devil and his his servants can perpetrate, only proves that they exist and therefore proves the existence of God. Uh, there, no matter how unfortunate the fate of Karis is. It's only there because the devil is fighting against God who exists and who loves us. Now, that's no consolation to the families of all these <laughs> murdered people in, in this movie. But I think it, it's a very interesting kind of philosophical way to tell a horror movie and to tell a very different kind of, of horror movie. And a scary one. Yeah. One of the things that I will say uh, for anybody who hasn't seen this and is interested in watching, this movie has one of the top five jump scares ever. And yes. it's the exact opposite of a jump scare. It, it takes, I think, 10 minutes. I think it's a 10-minute sequence. And the camera moves three times, I think. Yeah. And it's just absolutely amazing. It subverts everything uh, that you expect from, from a horror movie. And mm -hmm. I just love it. Yeah, I totally agree. And especially for Blatty, who is an author. He's, right. He didn't come up like from the techno side of filmmaking. He came in as the writer of The Exorcist and somehow managed to write this wonderful film dialogue for these actors to sink their teeth into and performed a remarkable feat of technical directing. Um, and so I, I wish he directed more movies after seeing this for, for sure. Yeah, I mean, there are so many odd visual things like, uh, and I'm sure you notice them all because you're uh, you're a man who loves comic books. And so you're always studying the frame yes. for the artistry. So you probably saw the Joker-like statue. Yeah, I, I did. Movie. Yes, yes. <laughs> and, like, and so he just has these moments just to freak you out. Yeah, And, and just, just speaking of framing, like I love how he uses the windows in the hospital to frame certain sections mm -hmm. of the of his frame. And so thinking from a comic book's perspective, it's almost like the page of a comic book where different frames of the page changes your perspective on the whole. I love how at one point there's just these voices and, and the wind is blowing and he looks in uh, a, a room that has a door open. One of the characters looks in Kinderman looks in to a room where uh, uh, there's just a, a desk full of papers and you hear something in Latin. And then one of the papers just lightly, floats up like the wind yes. got underneath it and he does one of my favorite things which scared me as a kid which is light changes uh in the middle of the day when a cloud goes a big cloud goes in front of the sun and the room can suddenly change in shadow mm -hmm. and it almost feels like things that are on the walls kind of move and he does that quite a bit in this film and i give him credit for that uh, it's something that most directors wouldn't take the time to uh, get across the motif of the stillness of what's going on. Yeah. And, and I also really uh, loved the returning motif of it's a wonderful life, both as a film yeah. and as a phrase, because that's a movie that I've loved since I, you know, could speak English though, so to see uh, these two old men connect with each other over that film. And then to see it usurped by this creature um, was so affecting for me personally and for and i think it's up to it's to bladdy's credit that he's willing to take a time to take the time to establish those thematic motifs as well as visual ones right and i think if there's one thing that i'll say about the the movie and bladdy's way of doing things i mean even the original exorcist the writing is that it must really uh, the most dangerous job in the world 
is uh, being a priest. It's like a superhero thing in and of itself. Because, I mean, everything that happens in this movie, when if you're, there's a priest alone, uh, um, the uh, priest is just kind of in there at the end, the one exorcist. For the winter? Bring in. Yeah, Father Morning, I think. Morning, morning, name. morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, he's at his uh, little apartment and the bird dies and the wind starts to blow and the crucifix falls off the, the, the wall and there's blood seeping from the wood around the tears of the eyes or uh, the uh, actual thorny crown. And that's only one of several sequences where wherever there's priests, there's like voices, disembodied voices and things blowing around. It's almost like in the old like 40s movies taking place in the Amazon jungles. There was always the guy, the, the big heavy set guy with a fly swatter who's just constantly swatting at mosquitoes. That's what it's like. It's like the demons are all around these fucking guys. <laughs> and it's constantly like, oh, man, don't mind that. The papers are ruffling because the, the demons are pissed at me. I, I exercise some of this morning. <laughs> I think it's funny because uh, my thing is, I, I, I've mentioned before that I have demonophobia mm -hmm. and it shows up every so often. It's because of how I was brought up. And so idea of the idea of the demons just sitting around freaks me out. And then I talk to someone who has none of this background. They're like, going, oh, my God, you know, sharks don't have any kind of uh, malice. They just go around eating. The only things in the world that have any spite are you and demons, you know, humans and demons. The only things that sit around plotting to do evil all the time. He goes, what kind of life is that or an existence is it for demons that they're going to spend all of eternity just sitting around trying to make you slip on a banana peel? Don't you think that's a little bit bizarre? And I can logically get that, and yet it still creeps me out. But I, I think that's why we watch horror movies, because it makes us believe in the illogical. Uh, it warps our brains, and then we, I think we come out of it um, with a with a sense of satisfaction. But also, but also, I think spiritually stronger because we've withstood the onslaught of William Peter Blatty. <laughs> right, exactly. And that's our show for today. I hope the the listeners you've enjoyed our open discussion about how horror movies have played around with popular beliefs and use them to tell stories about faith and perception and how easily popular culture can mix fact and fiction together and, and make a new truth. And that sometimes the horror stories we tell might just alter our image of evil and what that even sounds like. And I want to thank my guest, John Arminio, for being on. John, thanks so much. Tell everyone where they can find out more about you and what you do. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Quasar Sniffer. Um, I have the privilege of working at a comic book store in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania called Comics Connection. Uh, you can find us there uh, on Facebook at Comics Connection. That's comics with an X. Um, my social media feeds are filled with me making references to comic books where I pick uh, the best comics of the week. Uh, comics are great, you guys. You should go to your local comic book store. Buy books in 2018. It's a good investment. Please. Awesome. And I have to say, I have to have you on again to talk about one of my favorite artists, Gene Colan, because uh, he Definitely did the is. Dracula comics, which I absolutely loved. Anyway, uh, John, once again, thanks so much for being on the show and talking. It's been an honor. Thank you, Scott. And thanks, everyone, once again, for listening to the show. Yes, yes, yes. It is that time of the show again. Hey, thanks so much for listening to the show. And I'm really, really over the moon knowing that people are enjoying it as much as they are. I've had several people contact me about, say, financially supporting the show. And I do want to say that Hellbent for Har is a listener-funded show. I don't sell advertising. I, I don't waste your listening time with ads. Now, with that said, the show does need your help just to keep going uh, in the way that it has been. So if you do like the show and you think you're getting value from the show, there are several ways that you can help out. You know, you can tell others about the show, and uh, that's probably the best way that you could help the show. The more, the merrier. You can also write reviews on iTunes, and I want to take a moment to thank everybody who has done that. Uh, I've been getting a lot of really good ratings on iTunes. Uh, reviews are also fantastic, uh, but uh, hey, uh, I will not say no to people just going in there and putting a five-star review on iTunes. That helps us get found. The uh, Every time that I get a new uh, review or a new star, uh, I get 
moved up a little bit in the big, big, long line of uh, shows that are on the iTunes registry. Uh, now, you can also support the show financially by several different methods. If you want to use a credit or debit card, you can contribute an amount per episode using Patreon. And I want to take a moment to thank some of the new contributors to Hellbent for Har through Patreon. Uh, Dennis Gilmet, Jeff Reynolds, Vanessa Hoare and Jan Jones, thank you so much for taking the time and uh, giving a little bit of yourself to this show. I'm really appreciative that you feel that strongly about it, that you would like to support us. You can also contribute to Hellbent for Horror using PayPal. And with that, I want to thank Reed Finn for supporting the show through PayPal. Thank you so much, Reed. Uh, I was overjoyed to see uh, your name and your email, uh, which means that I'll be able to send you something uh, in gratitude for your gratitude in how the show has been going. Now, both Patreon and PayPal, hey, they take a percentage of your payment. And I do know that some people don't like to use PayPal or Patreon. So... H4H is also listed on Zelle, and Zelle is a digital transfer service that is an option to most U.S. bank accounts. So you can find me on Zelle by my email address, scott at hellbent for har, and just list a dollar value that you feel is fair. You can also make that a recurring payment by clicking on a button when you fill out the information. And finally, you know, I haven't done it yet, but if you're not into the whole digital payment thing, let me know. Uh, I'm thinking about setting up a P.O. box and then uh, anybody who's out there wants to send check or money orders or uh, lemon scented towels. It's that time of the year when getting a lemon scented towel is really nice. Uh, you can send it to that address. And if there's a way that you wish to support that I haven't listed here, just contact me and I'll get that service up and running for the podcast. All these payment options are on my website, hellbentforhar.com. So it's easy to support the podcast and keep it going. And I thank you so much, even just for listening. So let's go to the listener mailbag. Here's an email from Taylor Smith. My first kiss was not a moment I could pinpoint, but I think it started with those scary stories to tell in the dark books. I remember reading and rereading them and being fascinated when the rest of my friends were horrified. All my life, I have loved that adrenaline rush that only can come from horror. Again, big, big fan. Can't wait for more episodes. Sincerely, Taylor. Taylor, thanks so much for taking the time to write. And now we come to the pick of the episode. And the movie for this episode is The Corpse of Anna Fritz. I've got to say, I had to think about this one, uh, putting it in here. I will uh, right out front say this is an acquired taste, folks, and it is a pretty nasty idea. Uh, The story is about a... Uh, made-up movie star, Anna Fritz, who's very famous. She would be kind of uh, like uh, how Madonna was in the 80s, someone that no matter where she went, the paparazzi followed. Uh, Everybody knew who she was in love with. And in the very beginning of the movie, we start hearing all these radio broadcasts and television broadcasts talking about what she's wearing on the uh, red carpet and things like that. At the same point, while we're hearing all of this, we're watching a body being taken into the morgue in a hospital somewhere uh, in Spain. And it's Anna Fritz. She's died inexplicably at a private party. Uh, She collapsed inside of the bathroom. And the world is mourning the death of Anna Fritz. Now, the news about her death is spreading all over the place. And because of the amount of hanger-ons that there have been in her life and the amount of publicity that this is getting and the mania that is starting, they have kept what hospital she's going to be in uh, and what morgue uh, completely private. No one knows. It's in thorough secrecy. But of course, someone who works at the uh, at the hospital has to take a picture of the body and send that to their friends. And this starts a whole bunch of really disturbing things that happen. Uh, What we have is a hospital orderly who's working at night, leaks those photos, and when those best friends decide to come over, they come over because, well, they just have to have a moment with an untouchable goddess. I'll go no further than that, but let me tell you that 
the things that are probably going through your head right now happen very early in the film and a whole lot more happens. And the mixture of me feeling absolutely revulsed by this film and then absolutely stunned by this film and then revulsed again and then stunned again makes me want to put this on our list. So for this episode, the pick of the episode is The Corpse of Anna Fritz. And I give The Corpse of Anna Fritz five bone saws, five gleaming bone saws. Yes, that's right. And thanks for listening to the show. Hellbent for Horror was written and broadcast by me, S.A. Bradley, and produced by me and Lisa Gorski. You can find more on our website, hellbentforhorror.com, and I'm also on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash hellbentforhorror, and my Twitter handle is hellbenthorror. Please hit that subscribe button to get H4H hot off the press. And if you can do a review on iTunes or whatever app you listen to us on, that really helps people get to find us. And now for some Hellbent for Horror news. The podcast is available on some more outlets now, so you can listen to H4H on Spotify, iHeartRadio, and TuneIn Radio, as well as the regular iTunes, Android, and Amazon apps. And let there be swag. H4H t-shirts are now on sale. We have a store on tpublic.com with a bunch of Hellbent for Horror designs, and you can have your choice of t-shirts, sweatshirts, hoodies, coffee mugs, something horrible beautiful for you or that someone special. The link to the merchandise store is on our website, hellbentforhorror.com. And in the wings is a Hellbent for Horror book entitled Screaming for Pleasure. I'm currently writing it, and we're shooting for a release in the fall of 2018. So spread the word and keep your eye out. More info on that later. And until we meet again, stay hellbent.